Good evening, and thank you for joining us for Nagoya Players Interview. Tonight, I'm joined by a very special guest, Mr. Joe Siki. Joe is the director of our next production, Our Town. Good evening, Joe. Good evening, Sean and everybody else. Joe is a bit of a legend here in Nagoya. Uh, for those who don't know him, uh, he's been in Nagoya for about 20 years now, and he wears many, many hats. He's a teacher, he's a bar owner, and he's also an artist. Joe has been a part of our arts community in many different forms, from a painter to an actor to a writer. He's done his own plays, he's created his own shows, and we're very happy to have him with Nagoya Players working with us on Our Town. Joe, thank you for everything that you've done in, in all facets of our art community. So tell us about yourself, what brought you to Japan, and how did you get involved in the arts? Well, uh, let me just say, first of all, thanks to, I'm happy to be back with the uh, Nagoya Players. I have done several things over the years with the Nagoya Players. Sometimes it was just backstage, being crew. Sometimes it was, uh, I was busy just sponsoring. <laughs> Sorry, dog and cat. Hey, quiet, Teddy. Sometimes it was just, yeah, just uh, also a, a pet owner and has a, a lovely cat and dog combination. Yeah, then the cat will probably jump up here. She's a rescue kitten. She was uh, homeless and now she has a home thanks to Maria Gobbedeska and her sumo wrestling student. She was found as a kitten almost dead. And Maria and I have many communications and I knew Maria wanted to play an instrument which I happen to have at home, saxophone. And she never tried it. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I would trade you one saxophone for one homeless kid. And so that's how Ho-Chan came here. Well, but Maria does a great job in the local community with stray cats and homeless cats. So well, that's how Ho-Chan got here. A pretty good trip. Okay, we'll go, back to your, we'll go back to your question, John, sorry. All right, so you were uh, saying uh, you've been involved in the Goya Players before and you we've worked together on other shows and you've helped out with set and build stuff for us and set stuff up. Uh, but tell us more about your involvement in the theater. Yeah, so, uh, I, well, I'll go back to your original question. I came to Nagoya in 1997. I was a sister city exchange teacher. Up to that point, I'd been teaching in Los Angeles public schools. And there's an exchange program where you uh, come here for two years and you teach for a Nagoya City public high school. And it's a good program, but you're only allowed to stay in that job two years. I was still learning the language, I was enjoying Japan. So I switched to teaching university. But my connection with the arts is, is interesting. I, it goes back to literally, I would say childhood and the stick and the beach. You know, and that's that's where art started for me to a certain extent, but, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Teddy, quiet. Okay, right. so, Mm -hmm. But I, I came to Nagoya, um, and my first, actually one of the first, maybe a year after I'd been here, there was a publication in those days that used to put what was going on in the community and in the foreign community in particular, and, and it mentioned that there was a play being directed by the Nagoya Players. And I went to see that play, because of course I was a big theater goer when I lived in Los Angeles and oh, Virginia and elsewhere, but huge theater goer, and I went to see that play to say, well, okay, it was a play in English. I did, my Japanese was okay, but not good enough to watch a play, yet, right? And it was the Goya Players, and it was directed by Sarah Winslow at that time. In fact, I was just speaking to Michael Cruz about this yesterday evening. Anyway, it was, uh, uh, oh, geez, um, Midsummer Night Stream, and the costuming was fabulous, and the acting was good and and in fact uh one of the characters was played by the director sarah winslow's son leo and he was great he was wonderful he, he was playing puck and he had me laughing my head off right and some sort of japanese matrons sitting near me kind of were tis tisking it you can't laugh in the and i was like no this is hilarious i mean i didn't say that but in my head i was i, I quieted my laughter a bit but so that's how i got in, to realize in Nagoya, this town, this city, but no, there's a vibrant arts community. Before that, I'd been here a year, maybe a year and a half, can't quite remember when it was. You can look it up in the Nagoya Players files, right? And yeah. when I was there, I went out and they had 
all the photos Andy Boone had taken over the years of past productions. And I, they were at that point, Nagoya Players was doing, well, as now, two, two things a year, at least. Mm -hmm. And I looked and the first one was 1974 mm -hmm. or three. And I was like, wow, okay, this troupe has been here for a long time. And that, that fascinated me. And I met Sarah, the director of that play, and she told me about how they rotate the directors. And, you know, and I thought that was interesting and kind of fun and kind of also good. And so two years later, I started up a small publication, a magazine, a journal of literature produced in this area called Nagoya Writes. Mm -hmm. Now, Nagoya Writes lasted six years. Okay. And then I, well, I got busy. Now, to edit a publication like that, and we came out once a year, but... It takes a lot of time and fundraising, and and it was great. And I still have all the issues. In fact, there were a couple of years we came out twice. So I think I have like eight old issues. And then I started to meet the writers in our community, Sean. Um, well, now I've met you, of course. Yeah. Another writer from our community, guys, Sean. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm um, I'm I'm I think the turtle scene is about halfway through. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So Joe's referring to a, a novel I published. Uh, in the past year, Chizawa Bay. Uh, I've asked Joe to read it and give me his feedback. Oh, no, no, no. I wanted to read it. I wanted to read it. And I, I it's very kind so far. Well, I, 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 I like reading. That's. I tell you, one. You, you can ask people about their connection to the arts, and I'm trying to answer that honestly. Like I said, with me, we went to the beach as a family a lot, pretty much every weekend. I grew up in LA mostly, some Texas country, middle of nowhere. But even then, in the summers. We drove down to Padre Island and went to got to a beach. Mm. I grew up on a beach. And when you do that as a small child and there's a stick or anything you can draw on that sand with, you're drawn in the sand. And that's, to me, art stems from that simple impulse. Okay. And I've never lost that. I mean, I, I you could put me on a beach now where I'm supposed to meet somebody to shoot a film or to whatever and call me and say, Joe, we're 30 minutes late. And if there's a stick on that beach or anything I can draw on that sandwich, I'm not gonna be bored for 30 minutes. I am gonna have a great time. So I was, that's childhood part. Okay. How I got involved in this community is more along the lines of watching a play and then realizing that troupe had been doing this for over 25 years when I got here. And now it's 40, what is it, Sean? 40, uh so it started in 75 so Five, okay. yeah we just celebrated 30 years is that right no no 40 years but 75 so 25 yeah. plus 20 45 45 years okay all right so yeah so i mean math yeah well <laughs> we're artists so we don't need to worry about <laughs> but so i want to being counters can take care of the math. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wanted to jump in and ask you because I'm also from LA. I grew up there and I also, I was very lucky in a sense and maybe you feel the same, which is LA is just overflowing with art. And when it comes to performance and music and all of these kind of things, you're just spoiled. And every weekend you can go see a really great show, whether that's fringe or whether that's professional level. Um, right. And one of the things I felt coming over to Japan when I came, which was early 2000s. Yeah, okay, was, so a few years later yeah, than, than I did, yeah. I immediately felt, um, uh, where is the thriving art scene here? And it took me a while to find the circles in the communities, but I did get involved. But I guess my question would be, having come from, you know, an art scene like L.A. to an art scene in Nagoya, Japan, what do you find are the differences and the similarities between those kind of scenes? Well, the, the similarities are kind of simple. There is static art in Nagoya. There is static art in Los Angeles. So, for example, in Los Angeles, if you static art, meaning um, it's there. It's mm. always there. You'll look at it. So if you take the example of, uh, of the Watts Towers. Okay. Right. Now, I went, can't remember the year, but we had some school trip. We went there for the first time. Mm -hmm. I went back later when I was finished university. I was teaching 
uh, in a high school as a substitute. And I went to this, and I remembered when I was going to work, oh, the Watts, he gives kids the Watts Towers over or something. Now, the Watts Towers are famous because they were built by this Italian guy, I think, that that basically just kept building them, just kept, kept, kept mm-hmm. building them until he died. And that's static art in the sense you can still go see it, and it's still art. And that's in Nagoya, too. If you walk down Higashiyama Dori, basically from Fushimi all the way through Sakai, there are sculptures at regular intervals yeah. all along Higashiyama Dori. Now, both sides of the street, and they are uh, local, local, well, Aichi, Gifu, that kind of local artist. And those sculptures, there, you can go look at them anytime you want. And I do. One, I like to walk. And two, they're different in the rain. They're different in the sun. I get a different impression. Watts Towers are the same thing. Cloudy day, they look this way. Now, Watts Towers is one example, but LA has other types of static, static art. I mean, there's a museum here, there, there, there. You can always go see them. They're regular collections. Nagoya, same thing. Regular collections here, there, there, there. You can always go and see that. So that's static art. Now, changing art. Art that changes. The, the first time, uh, I, of course, I went to uh, Japanese museums. Sorry, that's Ho-chan. Hello, Ho-chan. There we go. Hello. Hello. So changing, that's changing is the wrong word. So not what's the opposite of static show? Help me out. Well, I, I usually say performing arts or performing you know, arts or uh, live arts if we if we can. You know that to a certain extent in LA, my experience was any Friday, any Saturday I got off work and I wanted to go out and see a band. I wanted to go out and see theater. I wanted to go out, you know, and watch a film crew on the streets. Mm. It wasn't hard to do. In mm-hmm. fact, I had one house in Venice apartment um, before Venice was unaffordable. I was living there with a roommate and they rented the back garage grassy area to do, to do their film buffet at lunch right yeah. because yeah. they were filming venice has a lot of uh areas in it which go back to like the 1900s and yeah. having any they're still there they build anyone to film in front of those so they rented basically our backyard and the owner of the bit we were renting but the owner of the building's garage area to cook their buffet for crew and you could go, and they gave us special passes because we were living in the house they were renting the backyard of. You could go a couple blocks down and get a pass to watch the filming from mm-hmm. close up. Yeah. I, I, no, I didn't. I didn't. But LA had that kind of thing, that kind of feel, right? Yeah, I I, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about because uh, when I was, you know, high school, university, um, you know, it wasn't an odd thing to see a film crew out and no. you know, the next Hollywood movie is being shot and you can kind of, you know, peek in and have a look and see what's going on. That's right. And, and they, you know, normally they didn't mind if you were quiet and on the sidelines, they didn't really care. Down at Venice Beach, they shot a lot of those cheap 80s movies. Yeah. Sorry, cheap 80s movies. You know what I'm talking about. High school. <laughs> <laughs> But but they were, you know, they were there. They'd be shooting. If you want to stop and relax and chill and maybe have a beer and watch them shoot, you could do that. So that's something that went on in LA. Now, when I got to Nagoya, that really wasn't here. Mm. Although I would notice sometimes small crews of professionals shooting two a two-person scene, for example. Uh in Sudamai Park, I saw it down at Nagoya Castle. And I did what I did growing up as a kid in L.A. Oh, they're shooting some. Let's watch. Let's see what they're shooting. Maybe I'll watch it later, right? Mm. And I would watch in Nagoya as well. But it wasn't prevalent like it was in L.A. Now, the laws have changed. Tax laws have changed. So now a lot of those things they were shooting in L.A. when you and I were there, Mm. they're shooting in Canada. Yeah. Tax base is cheaper. They're shooting overseas, right? So some of that has changed. I've heard. I mean, I haven't been back to LA in a very long time. But yeah, it's not I've as heard. friendly as it used to be. It is, it, yeah, it's not as um, cost effective. I think that. Yeah, that's it. But so, so live arts is that. But it's also things like in LA. I went to see uh, Nicholas Nickleby, okay. which is a 
eight hour play by Charles Dickens, right? Mm-hmm. That was, it was very fun. It was down at the LA Convention Center. You basically had, you, your ticket was for two days. Because mm-hmm. they didn't think anybody would want to sit through eight hours of a play. And Nicholas Nickleby is very long. Mm-hmm. But you got your first day, four hour ticket, and your second day, four hour ticket. And you got a lunch. And it was an expensive ticket. I couldn't even afford it at the time. I was uh, 19. My parents bought it for me for my birthday. Um, and I took my girlfriend at the time All right. and she was so excited because we we're going to do a lunch in downtown LA mm-hmm. on the Saturday. Right. And the Sunday we'd just go see the, and the final four hours, but that kind of thing is like, I'm not sure. It, you know, people might think who would have the patience to sit eight hours through a theatrical play, mm-hmm. but it was a British company and I can't remember the name. It might have been the Royal Shakespeare Company. I can't remember the name, but the acting was so good. You were not bored for a single minute of that four hours. And even that particular ex-girlfriend who often got bored about things, she wasn't bored. You know, and also she knew she'd chosen the right restaurant for lunch. And it was, it was a birthday present from my parents to me. My mother was also involved in, in theater. Uh, my mother acted as, and my mother raised seven children. Mm. She was a school teacher. And yet, as soon as her youngest child was uh, in high school Mm -hmm. and she was able to stop her teaching, she went back to the community theater. And we saw her in Picnic. In fact, my father just had the video digitized and sent it to me recently of my mom in Picnic, right? Mm -hmm. And she did community theater. She'd always done it when she was young. She got married, became a teacher. She had seven kids. So there was a 15, 20 year hiatus because we're of course, spread out over two decades in our birthdays, right? And then as soon as the youngest kid was safe, I suppose, she's back to community theater. So there's always been an understanding for me that community theater must have some kind of good reason. Because mm. my mother taught. Um, you know, it's from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you were the roots of you in theater are quite strong. Um, your mother was a theater performer, uh, and she exposed you at a young age. And you had this experience at nineteen, watching eight-hour shows and loving it. So yeah. um, it sounds like you know you you've always been on this path uh, to do theater or the performing arts. Um, so let's let's get into the theater talk. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, I guess let's talk about the show you're working on now, Our Town. Uh, okay. Our Town is a very famous show in America. Outside of America, it's not as well known, but it is performed worldwide almost weekly. Um, uh, yeah, I absolutely think it, yes. It, it, it would apply to any community. Mm-hmm. I don't care what your language is. It, there, there are elements in it that would apply to you. Where I don't care if you're living in a small place and Siberia. It would apply. So, uh, Our Town is very famous for its universal appeal. So, I'd like the audience to hear the story about how you first were introduced to the show, your first experience with Our Town. <laughs> that, goes, that goes back to my sophomore year in high school. Um, I was, I, w- I had a writing class, uh, an English class, but we basically it was called English, but we were writing poems and short stories, and I would turn them in like everybody else, and the teacher said to me one day, you know, after reading my, I think it was a poem, actually, she said, uh, you know, that we have a, a theater club at the school and we do a production every year and and you should audition. And I said, from my poem? And she's like, well, yeah, yeah from your poem. And I, I scratched my head and I said, so you think I can act because I wrote a poem? And she said something like, literally, uh, yes. Oh, okay. So I auditioned. Mm-hmm. And my older sister did too. She was a senior. I was a sophomore. And uh, she got the role of Emily, the big role. Mm-hmm. right? Uh, and it's a great role. And it's a wonderful role. And I got, I auditioned well enough to be cast as the stage manager. That's However, awesome. the director, it's a huge role. And the director at the time thought, yeah, okay, this sophomore who just auditioned and hasn't been with the troupe 
you know, for two years or three years. I think he might, I don't, he seems to be fine on the stage, but I don't know if he can handle it. So there was also another girl, a woman, a young woman, I suppose, who had auditioned, who also auditioned very well. So he split the role. Okay. So I didn't have to learn all the stage manager's lines, mm. unlike this time. <laughs> and we should mention that you are the stage manager in this. I am. I am. And I'm doing as best I can. But it's giving me a headache going over my lines every day. The people on the train next to me think I'm crazy. This guy <laughs> talks to himself. <laughs> he, got a lot of words. he says a lot. he likes words. Well, that's kind of the stage manager anyway. So you're in the anyway. Zone. So he split the role. So basically, yeah. I got the second half of the play. Well, yeah. from from about middle of act two. And uh, I also played in the first act, I played Joe Crowell Jr. And I, Teddy. And I was delivering the papers. So I was Joe Crowell Jr. in act one. Mm -hmm. And then I switched to this sort of hit country kid. All right. Well, Joe Crowell Jr. is a town, townie, a townie, a townie. Can I say that in this day and age? Can I get shot? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He was a townie, right? So he lives in town, right? In the play. And 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 I switched to this country kid who's ostensibly dead. Mm -hmm. He died young. Right? Yeah. And the, the, the director was our geez, what was he? he was our history teacher. No, he was our, he was one of the teachers at the school and also directed the theater club. And he switched me to this country kid, put me in overalls. I literally would go out into the baseball field and pick anything that looked like a hasty because of course this was los angeles mm -hmm. so we didn't have to have like you know hay straw or chewing yeah. i'd pick a piece of grass or i'd that was long enough and i'd stick it in my mouth and i'd walk around on the stage like this country kid as the stage mm -hmm. and uh one day it was really funny my sister was i think she just turned 18 before graduation her birthday is in april so she just turned 18 Mm -hmm. and I had seven seven brothers and sisters and she's the oldest and we know she's got a date and we know he's coming to pick her up in the house okay. and we lived in this hilarious old house it was built in 1900 right in the middle of El Segundo and it's the oldest house one of the oldest houses in El Segundo right at the time and it's it's an old house and it's got upstairs dormer type windows downstairs windows and the the rest of the six. Now, I'd been rehearsing with my sister in the play every day. Mm -hmm. So I knew all Emily's lines. All right. I knew all George's lines. All right. right. George is the love interest, shall we say. And this, it's basically probably one of her first dates. And he was a member of the crew. All right. For our time. I wasn't, he didn't act, but he was, he was crew. I think he was doing set building. Um, and they were doing it in their shop class and learning how to build set and that kind of thing but you know he was a member of the crew building stuff and haul, you know like 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 we do now we have to build the set and get it there he was doing that and he comes to pick her up in his car and i've got literally my older brother my three younger sisters and my younger brother mm -hmm. and my youngest sister is maybe four okay. years old and I give her her lines, right? And she, the four-year-old's line is, isn't the moon terrible? <laughs> which is a line from the play, which if you come and see it, which you should, you, you, you will recognize is nothing but a, I have a crush on you line, yeah. right? And then the responding line, George's line, I think I, we gave to my, my older brother, so imagine this, the four-year-old's in an upstairs window, like in the play, <laughs> where they're in an upstairs window. My older brother's in the other upstairs dormer window, open, and they come into the house and we hide. All right. The, the man, very nice man, name is Chris. I'm still friends with him. Um, they're, that eventually led to a child, my, my nephew, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Now that marriage didn't go so well, but yeah. Jim is, a great nephew still is and and chris his father i'm still friends with to this day he was the crew member my mm -hmm. sister uh yeah, julie it was playing emily and you know he comes to the house we all hide he comes in he's very polite he meets my parents 
he does the whole thing, right? Nice to meet you, Mr. Seeky. Nice, nice to meet you, Mrs. Seeky. He talks to my parents. Oh, uh, you know, my dad says the normal, right? Please make sure she's back by 10, 30, 11, whatever it was. And we're waiting. We're listening, you know, upstairs, downstairs, hiding in the living room windows. You know, he, he, he leaves the house with Julie, goes out. He actually literally opens the door for her mm. to the car. Mm. He had an old, it was great. He had a, he had a 1957, wasn't a Bel Air, but it was a Chevrolet of that or Buick, you know, that, that old big yeah, style, yeah. 50s, right? And he literally opens the door for her, right? And we're trying to not laugh. And we're, cause we know our lines, right? And, and uh, it's, it's, he's like, he's like, he didn't look like Cary Grant, but he's acting up Cary Grant. And she's, she enters the, the, the old 57 Chevy or Bel Air, whatever it was. It wasn't a Bel Air, so it was expensive. It was a Buick or one of those, right? Mm. He closes the door, he walks around, and she, it's summer, uh, no, sorry, it's September, but fairly warm in LA. She rolls down her window and I cue my four-year-old sister, Annie, uh -huh. I cue her. Uh -huh. And she's like, isn't the moon terrible? And manic laughter comes out of the entire house. And <laughs> poor Chris, he looks up, he's like, cause he knew the play too, he's crew, right? He's there every rehearsal. And he looks up and he's like, huh? And then the next slide, George's slide comes out from my brother. And then the younger sisters are, have the next lines. And just, I mean, it went on for five minutes and we could not stop laughing. I mean, I didn't get past my four-year-old sister saying, isn't the moon terrible? And I'm on the floor just, like, you know, and, and my poor sister. Mm. Now, again, she's the oldest sister. So she was a bit of a boss. Uh -huh. so she had it coming, John. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I well, I was, I was going to ask, uh, what was her, uh, what was her reaction to this? Uh, on well, eventually she let it go. She married the guy. Unfortunately, that didn't quite work out. But that's mm -hmm. another story. Okay, for so, another day. Um, but I, you know, I tell you, it was, it was just, it was because I was there every day at rehearsal. Mm -hmm. This moment for hilarity appeared mm -hmm. had i not been in that play that moment for hilarity would have never occurred to me we would have done other teasing things to the bossy older sister we would have but not not that one mm -hmm. and i think theater is 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 that it's the opportunity for not only hilarity but also sorrow and also grievance and also joy and i think our town has all of those things i mean it absolutely does yeah so and I was making the connections in my head as you were saying this, that, you know, um, this family experience with the show uh, is in the show itself, you know, the themes of life, love, and death. Um, this right. is what the show is most known for. Um, these moments of being together, loving each other, and then, as you were saying, you know, in the future, the marriage didn't work out and those kind of things. You know, the show goes it discusses, you know, the course of life. Absolutely. So as a director now, you're, you're performing and directing the show. So, you know, the double threat, but as a director and you're much wiser in your years now, how do you view the show now in 2021? We've just, we're coming out of a very chaotic time. Um, do you think the show still has a uh, meaning uh, in this day and age? Yeah, no, absolutely. And on two levels. One, uh, being slightly older, I don't know that any more mature, but <laughs> being slightly older now. Just the maturity I, are different things. <laughs> I, I would say now that I, I'm looking at it again in depth, close reading, if you will, mm. I, I would, if I could go back and tell my 15 year old, so maybe don't worry, don't ruin your big sister's first date. Okay. <laughs> no, because our in our town, mm. there there are the scenes that Thornton and Wilder wanted to display. Look, we never really look closely at every minute of life. Now I happen to remember that moment, but I don't mm. necessarily remember the day before. 
Mm. And my sister may have a different memory of that moment than I do. Mine is hilarity. Mm. Hers might be chagrin or, yeah. <laughs> you know, what kind of family did I come from? Right? Oh, unfortunately, we, we were all readers. Every child in my family was a reader. So we'd read things like Cheaper by the Dozen. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know it. We'd read things like The Great Brain as children. We'd read, of course, you know, Narnia Chronicles and we'd read Lord of the Rings. We'd read all that, but we'd also read these hilarious books like The Great Brain and, and um, you know, the, the funny ones, mm. you know, the, the ones that talk about big families. Okay. Right. Now, The Great Brain is the three, but they get this adopted English kid, whatever. You know, the, 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 sorry, what was the one I referenced earlier? The 12 children. Uh, uh, slip in my mind. Yeah. So, but but basically, that's a hilarious story of a man with six kids, his wife dies, a woman with six children, her husband dies, and they marry. And there's twelve kids, and they all have red hair. Mm-hmm. And the guy, it's just really, really funny. So we'd all read stuff like that. So in our house, if you pulled a prank on a brother and sister, it was kind of expected. Yeah, But at the same time, I would say to that 15-year-old me now, you know, Joe, let her have her first date, mm. right? You could tease her on the second date. Mm-hmm. And and I, that's about the only maturity I've been able to manage in the last 40 years. Let's put it that way. Uh, but, you step. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, can you, can you go back to your question one more time? There's so um, what I wanted to kind of uh, hear your thoughts on were the 15 year old version of you looking at our town and the older oh. version of you looking at it now, uh, do you think the show still has relevance in the same way, in a different way? How do you look at the show now? Yeah, well, okay. So, in those four decades since I last played the stage manager, obviously a lot more death has occurred to me mm-hmm. in my life and experienced personal friends family dying obviously a lot more love as i've experienced as well as watching friends experience and by love i i I mean family love as well as you know non-platonic love Mm -hmm. and i've experienced um yeah i've been to a lot more weddings and i've been to a lot more daily rituals Mm -hmm. you know in Japan, I showed up for morning meeting, 8.30 at high school for two years, right? You got to be there whether or not you have anything to do. You're that. And I think part of Wilder's point is that the more you pay attention to the small details of what's going on around you, the more of a saint or poet you might come. I think that's his point. And I watched more gardens that I planted Mm -hmm. grow up and more gardens that when I was in busy years, I couldn't plant Mm -hmm. grow up. And I've watched those parts of life that he talks about in the play. I mean, you, you, you often, well, you know, the play, so, you know, there, there are mountain lilacs, Mm -hmm. right? There's corn and peas and beans and heliotrope. There's butternut trees. He's pointing out that we really should focus on what life and all of life is. He talks about the moon and the sun and the stars. Mm. That's act three. He starts with the vegetables and the gardens, right? Mm. The daily life, right? In act two, he's on about the, the summers and the winters cracking the mountains, right? Things are passing by us the yeah. rains bringing the dirt step the, the days are passing by us and in act three which is of course well, as you said love uh, life marriage death mm-hmm. he's talking about things that are eternal and that gradually gradually go away like life gradually gradually disappears from us no matter how young we may be no matter how old we may be Every day, there are things gradually disappearing because, and I think his point is, we don't pay enough attention to them. Now, I think that's relevant to our time in this space, particularly after a very hard year for many, many people, not just here in Japan, but around the world. 
and not just where the play was originally set in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. United States of America, just across the Massachusetts line, but in the world, all right? Now, Brazil is now seeing rise in numbers, mm -hmm. about to be on par with the United States in terms of deaths. Okay, this was a very tough year and we're not done. Mm -hmm. Pandemics traditionally, okay, and again, you can refute me on this, but traditionally take three years before they're done. Mm. Now we're in year two. So I think this is particularly relevant, this play. Yeah. And yeah. especially with the scenes we've added, mm -hmm. that, hey, there is hope. Mm -hmm. Of course there's death. Yeah. Where's that gonna go, right? Your goldfish dies, doesn't it? Your first pet dies. Of course there's death. But there is hope. And I think his point is, if you focus on life, mm -hmm. there's hope. Knowing there's death, there's hope in life. And that's a hard thing for most of us, myself included, to interpret. Yeah. You know, Dernan, I'm going to die. Why should I do anything? And I think Thornton Wilder's point is, no, 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 no. In that, in that mountain lilac. Mm -hmm. in that laurel mm -hmm. you know in that pea vine in that bean stringing there's life that's a beautiful wonderful thing in that moon well now in this in the play it's romantic the moon it doesn't have to be because he brings it up in act three the death act mm -hmm. and he says and the sun many nights the sun and moon and star i think he wants to Remind you that if your eyes are open and if you're paying attention, there's hope. And I think in a year after a pandemic, which we're not done with, obviously, I think the play is especially relevant. There is hope. We can change this climate change thing. We can do that. We can get past this pandemic. We can do that by the simple things. You know, and when he tells Emily in the final act, and it, the line is so simple. It's hard to realize the whole play hinges on it, mm. right? She asks him, does anybody ever realize everything of the beauty of this earth? Every minute, every, every minute. And, and the stage manager's answer is so simple. It's mm. no. Yeah. It's simply <laughs> no. And then he, but he gives her hope. You know, he says no. And then he says, oh, well, you know. The saints and poets, maybe they do some. And I think Wilder's point was, we can all be a saint or a poet in some way, in enough of a way to enjoy the life that we've been, that we have, you know? Very, very beautifully said, Joe. Um, I don't know about that. I think he said it. Well, and it's not just, how many words is that? No. <laughs> the saints and poets, maybe they do some. It's nine words. Well, you know, I really sums up everything you just said. No, no, he sums up the entire play in nine words. I'm not capable of that, obviously, right? Yeah. <laughs> obviously, it takes me 90 to say what he said in that, you know, so. But, um, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. You know, all, all the messages you just spoke about, um, there's beauty in everything. There's life in everything. and. Um, we have to we have to kind of open our eyes to it and recognize it it's there and that's really why I think the show remains still powerful and relevant um it's it's a very beautiful show uh and i I'm really looking forward to our our production of it because you're doing a great job bringing that beauty to the stage. I'm doing my best, Sean. I, I'm, I'm going to try to get us all there. Mostly going to try to get myself there. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there. You know? But I'm going to try to get us all there. Well, but that's what I wanted to, maybe we can end on this. Um, it is a beautiful show. And uh, I really want to encourage people who can see the show, please come see the show. It's an important show. It's not been performed a whole lot in Japan, in its English, in the original English. So it's it's a unique uh, opportunity. And uh, I, I encourage you to come out and watch watch this amazing work. I, I do as well. And I agree with you there, Sean. And I'll tell you why. Um, 
there were many, many years where theater looked to the avant-garde, mm -hmm. and, and which which it should. And there were years where, you know, if it wasn't a ribald production that was doing nudity on stage that nobody else was doing, it wasn't seen as cool, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, a, a play like Our Town got a little bit neglected. Mm. Not not by everybody. Community still did it. High school still did it. Mm. Um, universities still did it. And even some uh, Hollywood made a few different versions and you can find them on YouTube if you're interested, but so it wasn't completely forgotten. And I think there's a reason for that. Mm. And it isn't that neglected may be the wrong word. It was seen as well. Wow, that's a little old fashioned for our time. Mm -hmm. But now this in the last year, there was an article that we all shared in the one of the uh, London papers, the Guardian, I think. The Guardian was it, yeah. And there was one in one of the US papers, maybe the Post, Washington Post, I don't remember. And they're like, oh, during the pandemic, our town is relevant again. Basically, that it's, I mean, to make a short summary, right? Our town is relevant again. But my point is, and I think yours, Sean, mm -hmm. it was never not relevant. That's right. It never was. Now, did it become more relevant because of what everybody went through last year? Mm. Perhaps. Maybe. Which is good. Which is good because it should have always been relevant. But mm -hmm. you know how people are. They want the newest, the latest, the greatest, you know? But I went to see the, the Banksy exhibit uh, a couple months ago with a friend who's also in theater. Uh, he's got his own theater, KPB, Stevie P. Mm -hmm. We went to see the Banksy exhibit and he wanted to walk. So we walked from literally out where he lives in, in the boonies, let's put it that way. And we walked like, I don't know, let's say 12 kilometers. We saw the Banksy exhibit, which is great. And I loved having it here, you know? And that's to me was, okay, if I can wear my mask and go into a confined space and walk around while other people walk around and look at Banksy's stuff, right? I can go to the theater again too. Mm -hmm. We were safe, that was months ago and you know, everybody went to that exhibit. I haven't heard of any cases. So I think we're able to go to the theater. Yes, we have to wear our masks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, we have to sit whatever distance the theater requires apart from us. Mm -hmm. But the hope I also wanted to bring after last year mm -hmm. was that we can do theater again. Mm. You know, and some of the new scenes, Sean, I don't know if you realize, probably you did. I'm sure you did. But there are some new scenes that I've written uh, to sort of make our town relevant to 2021. Mm -hmm. The original play starts in 1901. Well, don't, don't give it away, Joe. Don't I'm not. Away. I'm just saying I've added some new scenes and those are for hope. Mm -hmm. And is it just my hope that we can do theater again? I think it's, it's in Thornton Wilder's original script mm -hmm. that we can continually have hope throughout our life, even throughout our death in his wording. And so that's the reason for the new scenes. And I'm not going to give them away. I won't say anything about that. Or that, or that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I, we we want people to see that in in. We want the honest reaction and. Absolutely. So and so do I. <laughs> All right. Okay. Are you signing off here, Sean? Are you signing me off here? All right. No problem. Well, we we have been going at it for a little bit, Joe. Um, so. It's been a fascinating conversation. Now it's Ho Chan's turn. Ho Chan. <laughs> Buy a ticket. Buy a ticket. Come see the play. <laughs> thank you, Ho Chan. All right, Joe. Well, thank you for all the hard work you've put in. Um, it is a really great show, and uh, I really look forward to seeing this on stage. Yeah, me too. So, and thank and you, thank everyone. You. Uh, check us out on social media, the website. We've got a lot of great content, interviews. Uh, blog pieces, photography. There's lots of great stuff. And Thank most you. important, come come and see the play. Yes, come. Wear your mask and come see the play. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>